All right, everyone. Hello. Uh, my name is Monet Clark. And this is uh, going to be a performance and artist talk for the exhibition Invocation Democracy. Um, if you're in Europe, good evening. If you're in the United States, good afternoon. And uh, thank you so much for being here with us. It's our second talk for Invocation Democracy, a political and mystical virtual exhibition, which is presented by the wonderful Pro Arts Commons in Oakland and is accessible within three galleries that are 3D galleries embedded into their website um, and curated by myself, Monet Clark. And I'm also an artist with one performance video work in the show. If you have not yet seen the show, I really urge you to go and experience it uh, sometime after this talk is over. It puts a few new twists on things and um, is up through Inauguration Day, January 20th, 2021, holding vigil for a peaceful transition of power and the democracy that we envision. You can find it by Googling Pro Arts Commons and look for the link in the chat. Um, can you put a link in the chat? We'll put a link in the chat also to the show. Uh, please be sure to visit galleries two and three as well as one. Um, uh, it progresses mystically as it goes. So we have a special treat today. Linda Montano, the life is art master herself is performing for us. She has a performance video work passing through in gallery three in the exhibition. And we have a wonderful, uh, panel discussion with three of our other artists in the show, uh, which is um, Anne McCoy in New York City, who's known for her very large drawings, but she's also a sculptor and a projection artist and has been a student and researcher for 50 years uh, of alchemy. So she has an amazing knowledge base. Uh, and um, we have Darren Martin, who's a sublime performance video and photographic artist and professor speaking to us from the East Bay. And we have Edgar Fabian Frias, who's going to be newly residing in the East Bay, is a multidisciplinary artist, indigenous. Let, say your tribal name, is it Wixerica? Uh, Vitarica. Vitarica, okay. See, I always slaughter names. Um, indigenous Vitarica, spiritual practitioner and psychiatrist. There's a really interesting mixture of things um, that he's working with. Uh, we'll have a, a Q and A um, after our panel. And so you can put your questions in the chat or in your comments, we welcome that. Uh, one note, Linda Montano is only singing right now. She's not talking, so she won't be part of the Q and A. She will also close uh, the event after we do our discussion. So we live in a time when the dominant Western perspective, intellectualism and critical theory have compartmentalized and separated the mystic, the subconscious, the irrational, the invisible world like our energetic bodies and the mystery surrounding our very existence in life itself in a kind of category of the weird or the exotic or surprising or curiosity. And so these parts of our culture and ourselves are marginalized and dismissed. I'm interested in how art practice itself feels, fills that void. Um, and I want to explore the um, mystic and the subconscious as they relate to each of our panelists art making processes and lives in general and the world in general and why putting the mystic and the political in tandem uh, in a show like Invocation Democracy is relevant. Um, we know that many of the political abolitionists were also into spirituality and the study of mystics and spiritualism uh, in the art world in the 19th and 20th centuries and activism like the suffragettes and so forth um, went hand in hand. I'm interested in the practicality and uh, normalcy of the mystic and the unconscious as they relate to our physical lives. Okay, so we're ready for... Um, the images, you ready for Linda's images? Yep. Okay. So Linda Montano was born in 1942 in Saugers Tees, New York, uh, and raised in a devoutly Roman Catholic household. Her life as art body of work is in itself a spiritual quest. 
2015, in an interview in Art Practical, she said this, the spiritual quality of mass so influenced me that I wanted to live in a world, live in that world. It is easily obtainable by finding out what other cultures do to get there and make it happen. As I grew in wisdom and California intelligence and feminism and justice, I found there was another piece, a missing link. Had I grown up in a culture in which ritual and matriarchy were synonymous, I would be a different person. I wouldn't have had to become a performance artist. Um, our panelist, Dan McCoy, said of Montano's work recently in a talk, she has what I call a religious attitude towards the work. She started out as a novice and was going to be a nun, but left the convent and became a performance artist. For Linda Montano, this is really an inner quest. And the Catholic side is part of the archetypal, archetypal container, but does not contain it. She was trained as a sculptor with an MFA from the University of Wisconsin and began working with performance dressing as a chicken She's known for her arresting ecstatic performances of the 1970s in which she handcuffed herself to fellow artist Tom Marioni or blinded herself for days. She is blindfolded, excuse me. She is one of the first artists along with peers like Marina Abramovich, um, touching uh, Shinhe, I believe it's pronounced, Vito Aconsi and Gina Payne to name a few to explore the physical limits of the body and its capacity for endurance as a legitimate form of artistic inquiry. Upon meeting Teqing Hishinghe, Montano joined him in his art life in a one year performance, which is just an amazing piece still today to look, to look on. Um, and they endured a remarkable collaboration where the two artists were bound together, keeping apart by a length of rope with no touching for 24 hours a day for a whole year, from July 4th, 1983 to July 3rd, 1984. And I read an article recently that someone said how relevant this was in the time of COVID when we can't have as much touching of each other and we're, we're separated. She is an accomplished filmmaker. Video Databank says Montano's work is starkly autobiographical and often concerned with personal and spiritual discipline. Her avowed interest lies in learning how to live better through life-like artworks with personal growth evolving out of shared experience, role adoption, uh, and ritual, exploring a wide range of subjects from personal transformation and altered consciousness, like primal scenes in 1980 to film, uh, hypnosis and eating disorders in the film Anorexia Nervosa in 1980 also, and Montana's work from the 70s and early 80s was critical in the development of video by and for women. And I know for me, Montano's 1978 work, Mitchell's Death, uh, was the first performance artwork I saw that spoke a language I really understood and it turned a light bulb on for me uh, to the potential that the medium held um, for my expression. And that was when I was still an undergrad. So she's had a, uh, definitely had an impact on me. Montano embarked, um, on an ambitious project titled Seven Years of Living Art, where she wore monochromatic clothing, spent a portion of every day in a colored room and listened to a designated tone, all of which corresponded to the energetic qualities of a specific Hindu chakra. She changed color each year, then followed it up with another seven years of living art. And Montano says it allowed me to become intimate with the seven Hindu chakras as art life. And she cites the book on her website, Why People Don't Heal and How They Can by Carolyn Mace, which was a a book that made a huge impact in the kind of healing community in the in the 90s. I read it too, and um, it uh, explained that this woman had a vision about how the seven Hindu chakras, the Catholic sacraments, and the tree of life rites in the Kabbalah all reference the same universal spiritual and life rites. And so, you know, that was really an amazing contribution to theology. Two of a longer list. Uh, things she learned from her seven years of art that she lists on her website is one intuition is a good friend and irony is sometimes better and intention is everything and for any of you out there uh, or our panelists who do uh, prayer and spiritual work that you know uh, and, and performance work too that intention is everything um, her role uh, playing live 
uh, her role playing as uh, life as art performances have involved working with the process as caregiver in her father's infirmary and death, uh, playing Bob Dylan, which we had a visit visitation from last time. Oh, there's our Mother Teresa, uh, and, and playing Mother Teresa, embodying these roles. In 2019, she presented her masterful and extensive exhibition, The Art Life Hospital at the Dorsky Museum in New Paltz, New York. Uh, which I was lucky enough to see. Uh, it involved a culmination of her lifelong investigations and processes with chakra stations referring to these stages we go through in our life and as we die, enlisting lectures from a death doula who acted as who acts as a kind of midwife, healer, and counselor, helping a person get past anger, regret, fear, etc., when they learn that they have a terminal condition. That was an amazing talk. Um, and she had an undertaker come and speak to the audience about the processes that his business uh, enacts to help family members when a loved one has passed. Um, so I'm gonna finish up with some images from that exhibition. Linda said it allowed her to practice her own death, which was very brave. And it also allowed all of us to practice our own death too. Um, so we're just gonna go through these images a little bit. These are. Um, these wonderful dolls she made. It's like, you know, there's a process towards the end of your life where you're, you're, you're kind of childlike, right? You kind of go through this arc. You go to the next one. Mm -hmm. Why did these get, um, they're getting pushed off. Oh, cause I have the, the chat. Okay. Yeah. So you can see the chakra stations at the end there. Yeah, I can that. And people were able to write on them. And so people could really interact you were allowed to sit down uh, in a rocking chair and hold the dolls. So you really had a, a, a total immersive interaction um, with her. And then um, go ahead to the next one. This tells you a little bit about the nursery where the dolls were. And see how she says, hold and rock the chakra dolls located next to the rocking chair. Okay, next. This was um, some pencil writing that was on the wall by the um, casket that she herself laid in. And it was very faint. It, it was really beautiful. Okay, next. And here she is practicing her death. And I love the incorporation of the video. She had a friend of hers who was nursing, um, videotape her nursing and saved uh, the mother's milk froze it uh, for, a, I think it was about a year before the performance happened and then she had the nurse feed it to her. And then she had her resurrection. Next picture. And there she is. <laughs> it was really a high, a high point. That, that show was a definite blast of energy. Um, okay, so next we have Anne McCoy. Um, we have our number one picture. Yeah. Anne McCoy is a New York based sculptor, painter, art critic, and editor, editor at large for the Brooklyn Rail, but known primarily for her large format drawings. And she also does work with projection and installation. She has designed for the theater and is, a li and is licensed for theater projection. She worked with Professor C.A. Meyer, Young's hair apparent, for 25 years in Zurich and has a background in Jungian psychology, archeology span and philosophy. She has studied alchemy since the early seventies in Zurich and Rome uh, at the Vatican Library and the Palazzo Corsini. She has a really amazing knowledge of uh, alchemy. Um, she was awarded a 2019 John Simon Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship. She has lectured on art history, the history of projection and mythology in the graduate design section of Yale drama a school of drama the last 10 years and taught in the art history department at Barnard College for 20 years from 80 to 2000. She has an extremely rich relationship with her inner life, her subconscious visions and dreams, and an expertise, like I said, in alchemy, which are all reflected in her transformational subject matter with, within potent works. She has an encyclopedic knowledge on the classics, mythology, the occult, and mysticism. She utilizes her platform at the Brooklyn Rail to address 
biases in the art world which dismiss the importance of spiritual mysteries, the irrational, the dream world, and the unconscious, and has written many articles on older women artists exploring spirituality and the unconscious, and her research is ongoing. Her recent project, Spirit Voices, Women Voices, with Professor Susan Arberth, uh, Aberth, was a Zoomed presentation for the Brooklyn Rail, which is on YouTube and has gotten an enthusiastic reception and seems to be feeding a missing element in the art world that audiences are craving. So you can take a look at that. Women, spirit voices, women voices. Anne McCoy's uh, work is included in the following collections and it's quite impressive. The Met, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, the Hirshhorn Museum and Sculpture Garden, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, the National Gallery of Australia, the Royal Roy L. Neuberger Museum, the New Orleans Museum of Art, the San Francisco Museum of Art, and the Whitney Museum of Art, among others. Anne McCoy has received the following other awards, the Asian Cultural Council, the Pollock Craster Foundation, the Adolf and Esther Golied Foundation Award, and award in the visual arts, the Prix de Rome, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Berlinger Kussler Program, DAAD, and the New Talent Award of Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Anne McCoy has exhibited in the Venice Biennial Whitney, Whitney Annual and has had one person exhibitions in New York, Los Angeles, New Delhi, Poland, and Berlin. All right. So next I want to talk about Edgar Fabian Frias. This was the first piece that I saw of Edgar's. Um, these are video stills, and it was for a show um, called Superman, which is a live broadcast art show um, out of LA by another artist in our show, Liz Walsh, who has a wonderful piece in Gallery 2, a video animated piece. And I just immediately felt like, oh, I understand this person, you know, like <laughs> I get this work, and it, it was, um, you know, it had humor. I used a lot of humor too. And it, you know, so it delivered these, you know, very simple potent things with this wonderful humor to it. So this is the first time we're meeting. Um, Edgar is a non-binary queer indigenous. Oh God, say it again for me, Edgar. The yeah, Bidarika. Bidarika, multidisciplinary artist, curator, educator, and psychotherapist. And at times is referred to, um, and say this, brujas, brujas? Uh, brujekis or brujex? Brujex. Um, this is a term that simply means witch in Spanish, but it reflects a currently contemporarily a hybridity in contemporary spirituality. Frias works in photography, video art, sound, sculpture, printed textiles, gifts, performance, social practice, and community organizing as a medium amongst other emergent genres. Most recently, they have integrated their diverse practices and collaborative partnerships into large-scale interactive installation experiences to alter states of awareness and create temporary sanctuaries acting as conduits for respite, empathy, self-reflection, humor, and curiosity. Frias's work nicely combines the political with critiques on capitalism, the prison system, systemic racism, and more with earth-based medicine and spiritual practices and psychotherapeutic methods. So the scientific and the metaphysical, the communal and the interpersonal. Frias has quite an Instagram following and they make wonderful uh, political spiritual spells and statements using that platform quite effectively addressing the events of this political era as they unfold. Much like Karen Finley's works, um, her word paintings are addressing things as they unfold on Instagram um, in her works. And we have a few examples of Karen Finley's works in the show. Uh, I'm interested in the way they bring the indigenous perspective into these modern platforms, as well as what I've learned uh, to for years, uh, what I call the um, Southern California spiritual melting pot subculture. As Frias was born and raised in East Los Angeles in 1983, Frias is a millennial. And I bring this up because there is such a huge shift in this generation in the art world in the breaking down of some of the barriers and biases which our elder artists, especially those working with mystic and spiritual subject matter, have endured, and also in their integrating of art and other disciplines, and just an integration of fine art with mass culture through media platforms such as Instagram and YouTube and various 
shows and blog platforms, which have shifted, shifted focus away from the segregated uh, art world and an elitist art world. Frias moves through this new territory fluidly as well as participates in the traditional art world and academia. Frias received dual BAs of psychology and studio art from the University of California, Riverside in 2013, an MA in clinical mental health counseling at Portland State University with an emphasis on interpersonal neurobiology and somatic psychotherapy. So this is really mind body, mind body stuff. Um, Frias is also a 2022 candidate for an MFA in art practice at the University of California, Berkeley, and just finished being a visual arts fellow with the Tulsa Artist Fellowship in Oklahoma and was a research fellow for the Oklahoma Center for the Humanities Research Seminar on Play and is a graduate student instructor for the UC Berkeley course, Visual Cultures, Aesthetics of the Digital, focusing on the interactions between image, mind, and society. Look at that wonderful picture on the left where he's just at one with the rock. <laughs> Love it. Okay, ready for the next? Darren Martin. Ah, oh, this is wonderful. So Darren Martin's focus in re recent years has been to engage the synesthetic, synesthetic, sometimes I can't pronounce things, you guys, sorry, qualities of perception. Dar Darren, say that word for me. Oh yeah, you have to turn on. <laughs> this isn't fast enough. Oh, you said it right, synesthetic. Synesthetic, yeah. okay, synesthetic qualities of perception. Do you want to tell us what that means? Just so we're really- well, I mean, you know, the, the medical term synesthesia comes from a very rare condition where um, deep in the brain's hippocampus, uh, input from one of the senses uh, is somehow translated into something else. So the most common form is like hearing, you, you hear sounds that in, insinuate color, people visually see. Oh, but sorry. artists throughout time, like or throughout the last few centuries have been in, engaged with the in those ideas and ways that, you know, how sound might affect an image or how images might in some way incorporate taste or what does smell do, you know, so thinking about this kind of like, um, crossroads of perception. Well, it, and it's, the, and it's the, the, the lack of, of separation, which I think is a big problem in, in all these different modalities, but certainly when you're speaking to, to the body, the lack of holistic you know, understanding of, of the whole organism as, as a influencing each other, different parts influence each other. So you wanna treat the whole body. And it's kind of like, I would imagine that a taste could taste differently depending on what mood you're in right? Or what you're seeing or experiencing, right? There's an interplay. Yeah. And we tend to separate so much in this, this culture, which we'll talk about. So, um, so he's been uh, focusing on, on that, on the qualities of perception through video performance sculpture and uh, print-based installations shaped by disability studies queer theory, and his own experiences with deafness. His projects often consider notions of accessibility through the use of tactility, sonic analogies, and audio descriptions. His work works occupy space within body politics, analog to video, uh, analog to digital video equipment, fetishization, altered states of consciousness, and his finished works have often a sublime kind of disrupted gracefulness where he meets concerns of the body, the psyche, the spirit, the politics, the intellect, and the technology all at once. My first experience, exposure, this is him, my first exposure to film and video as a means for artistic expression was in the, my late teens in art school. Video art pioneers like Namjoon Pike spearheaded investigations in an image and sound processing uh, through hacking into existing electronic devices or teaming up with engineers to make new ones. My early access as a maker of moving images was limited to the use of Super 8 film and VHS video, yet I was exposed to ways in which those mediums could be altered through the use of both analog tools and digital technologies. This curiosity to explore new tools and processes to develop my visual language has carried on throughout my life as an artist. He goes on to say another early influence uh, were feminist artists such as Carolee Schneeman and Mar Martha Rossler, whose use of their own bodies and gestures in both film and video spoke volumes about the repression and 
uh, about repression and patriarchy. Meanwhile, other artists like the Viennese actionists and the Japanese dance movement Butoh considered the body through both expressive and transgressive acts as a response to the violence of the modern era. I was then com coming of age in the late 80s and early 90s as a young gay, ma gay man feeling threatened by AIDS and the um, culture wars. Through both art history and media, I faced the undeniable fact that the body is politics. For over 10 years, Beginning with the new millennium, I have made works that have been informed by my own experience with a sudden hearing loss and the synesthetic impact upon my senses. Moving beyond both the idea of loss and autobiographical influences, I have recently been working with a group of artists and scholars in the area of disability studies, considering broader cultural representations of disability. We have also actively developed ways in which to consider notions of accessibility being built into a work of art as its inception, at its inception rather than an afterthought. Darren Martin's works have screened at the Museum of Modern Art, New York, Pacific Film Archive, California, Impact Festival, Netherlands, European Media Festival, Germany, and many others whose installations have exhibited at, at venues including The Kitchen in New York, Grand Central Art Center, California, the Aggregate Space Gallery in Oakland, Moscow State Vidim Sitter Museum in Russia, Macintosh Gallery Canada, and most recently at Soma Arts. And we're gonna talk about that show when we um, speak with him. And we're going to look closely um, at it because it, it, he told me it was foremost on his mind. This is a picture of it here and it, it's really, yeah, it's really amazing. I wanna show when we talk to you a, a little bit of video clips because the sound is, is so important. Um, Martin also uh, frequently cl collaborates with artist Torsten Zenas Burns, who is a dear friend of mine and a mad scientist of the medium of performance video, building diverse speculative fictions around reimagined educational practices and dystopian cosplay paradigms. Their works have been included in screenings and exhibitions in um, uh, many, many of them internationally um, and have done very well. I'm not gonna read them all because it's just such a long, it's a long list. Um, their last project, ARC3, the workshop scenarios, we have a clip of it also. Um, it's interesting to me because they, they get into uh, a narrative about post-apocalyptic a post-apocalyptic world that has been ravaged by pollution and waste and their science fiction mobile lab roams the landscape populated with feral children, feudal barons and supernatural beings. Um, they commune with the animal and insect world, which I love that part. And these earthbound bionauts mine the environment around them looking for clues to their ancestral past as a way to pave a possible, a possible way into their uh, simulated futures. And um, they work with animal spirits, seances, past life regression sessions, and so forth with participants and workshops. And anyway, I, I saw some of that work live and it was a lot of fun. Um, okay, so that is our panel. And we get to have a performance by our wonderful Linda. It is time, my darling, for you to turn on your mic and uh, your video. Oh, here she is. So Linda has asked me to pick a number between 1 and 24, I think she said. And this will correspond with the song. <laughs> and um, I'm going to pick five.
Nice mood setting, huh? <laughs> All right. Oh, we have a, a comment. Lovely. I agree. That was lovely. Okay, so I'll go back to our gallery view. Thank you, Linda. Um, Yes, that indeed was very uh, a, a religious experience. I'll, I'll just say that. <laughs> huh? Um, okay, so we're going to talk to Anne. Pull ourselves out of pull ourselves out of trance. <laughs> thank you, uh, thank you, thank you, dear Renee. You have done such a good job. You did your homework. It was wonderful. You've just, it, it, thank you so much. Well, it's really, um, you know, we're all going through this isolation and uh, it's been a joy. <laughs> it's been a real pleasure to, um, you know, have the time and uh, make the time to go deeper. You know, we, we scratch the surface with each other's work, you know, and it's, it's really wonderful to go deeper and see where the different connections are. I feel like we need to uh, to acknowledge an ancestor here. And that is that uh, someone I knew in, in Berlin in the 70s, and that's Joseph Boyce. Joseph Boyce. <laughs> I was I, asking you about him, but you know, he was yeah. in the first talk, he came up. I mean, he's just been. No, Joseph Boyce was, was uh, I, I knew him in Berlin in the 70s. And Boyce was really, I think, the you know, he, the performances of things like I Love America and America Loves Me with a coyote at the Rene Block Gallery, his interest in alchemy, Rudolf Steiner, Catholicism, mysticism, um, at, and, and political activity and performance and sculpture and installation. Um, I think one of the problems was that sort of America went in the direction of Andy Warhol and instead of boys and also uh, it wasn't just a question of the mystical being kind of pushed aside. It was a question of anything mystical basically being demonized. Because what happened is when the Frankfurt School came in, Theodore Adorno wrote several books against the occult, things like Stars Down to Earth. So that, I mean, a whole like 30 years of art students were educated in things like the Whitney program. The Whitney Independent Study Program, where if you said words like spiritual or mystical, it was considered absolutely taboo. And I mean, I had my own issues with these people beginning at UCLA Graduate School, where I had to switch to philosophy to get away from Carl Wertmeister. But I mean, this was, it has been a really long slog. And I think that what broke this whole thing open in a big way 
I mean, it's been breaking open slowly. There were three exhibitions on Rudolf Steiner in Europe. Uh, Boys, of course, it's always been going strong, but um, I think the Hilma of Clint exhibition breaking all attendance records at the Guggenheim, 66,000 people. Flew to I New think, York to see it, you know, like I had to be there and a lot of people were like that. It was like, you had to go, you know? It was, it was yeah, it, when it, it was amazing. It was amazing. I wrote about it. So I got to go, you know, to some pr the press stuff, which was incredible to see it with no people. But um, I think that that exhibition really has opened a door. I mean, now we're getting thousands of people trying to knock it off and people with superficial quotations of the occult, all of that. But right. I think that there are many, many people who are longtime practitioners like Linda Montano, myself of all kinds of spiritual traditions, all kinds of shamanic traditions. Mm -hmm. And that this is incredible because, uh, I mean, art dealers are still terrified to touch it but I think that it's opened a door in the art world that has just been slammed shut for a long time. And academia and... Um, oh, academia, forget it. I mean, if you were involved in this... Kind of stuff, I mean, I got fired by Benjamin Buchlo. If you were, because I had a gay Jewish cannibal lecturing to my class on uh, the Osmot of New Guinea, and they made a, a famous film of it called Keep the River on Your Right, a modern cannibal tale. But I got fired for that, so that it, you would you would get deplatformed. You couldn't publish anywhere, and if you were involved in these things, you could be fired. Well, and it was a, you know I, I brought this up in my last talk. I mentioned um, a painter named Ed Ed Moses, and I I didn't mean to disparage him, and I you know I I I listened to it later, and you know I can be a bit of a talker, but um, you know I I definitely respected him as a shamanic kind of painter, I think his process was very deep. But the point I was making is this man when a, could say in press, in, the, in public, in articles, I'm a shaman and everyone would go, oh, you're a shaman. But then someone like Mary Course, who's a couple generations younger than him, but makes these really sublime um, white on white paintings that are very much about Tibetan Buddhism and mysticism. And she couldn't talk about it that way because she would totally demiss dismissed out of the art world for talking. I, I actually knew both of those people really well because I was an LA artist in oh, California so the, till, till, the, the till 76. Yeah, I mean, Ed was, a, Ed, was a bit, Ed was a bit of an old carbuncle, but, and Mary Course, absolutely. I mean, uh, you could I, say that and she couldn't, you know, yeah. like that, you know, that I just thought of it as a shaman. I thought of him, I thought of him kind of in the school of Billy Al Bingston, but, um, well, Mary if, Course. When I say shaman, it's I don't mean him in the way that Joseph <laughs> Boyce was a shaman, but he, I think that his process was very deep, and I think he was a real artist, and I have a lot of respect for his process and his work. I'll just say that. But to call himself a shaman, yeah, it was a little over the top. But he said it in print, and they all ate it up. Oh, he's a shaman, you know. So I just the the sexism is so blatant, right? You know, in that in that example. I think that there were some wonderful LA artists who really were shamanic in a way, like Wallace Bierman. I mean, Wallace, Wally Bierman was really in a class by himself. Definitely. He was a great, great, great soul. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, I grew up in Topanga Canyon. Oh, no wonder. <laughs> so I was surrounded by the shaman artists. So, you know, I've been in the subculture and uh, the mystic subculture and the California uh, melting pot mystic subculture from my, you know, being a baby all the way through all my mother's friends, my mother. So I've really been steeped in it all from the very beginning and then went really deep for my own healing of recovery of my health. So um, there's a lot of uh, deeply uh, spiritual practicing artists, but it's not been something that was um, really kind of safe to talk about. I told you in the writing, like to, 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 to talk about my work as mystic as it is for me has not been something that I've been comfortable to do because, you know, I'd be just dismissed and also made fun of just for growing up in the back to nature subculture in general, there's a, there's a stigma. So I feel it's changing. Um, and I, these schools, these Frankfurt schools and positivism 
that you mentioned. The positivism. Oh, I, think yeah, it, I mean, it's going out now because most of those people are dying off. Unfortunately, they're acolytes. <laughs> they're still running departments, but uh, it's opening up a little bit. I mean, it's, it's opening up, uh, I think, and every once in a while, somebody kind of makes it through someone like Harry E. Smith in New York, you know, that are, are, and I think that it's a few people do make it through, but it's been, it's been pretty hard and it's been impossible to really write about any of these things in a sincere way. What, what is the definition? Tell us because you know it so well of positivism, po positivism. But it's sort of what you, what you see, what you hear, what you taste, it, 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 what you, what you can perceive really. That's reality only. Yeah. 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 And the Frankfurt School based everything on science, right? No, what the science Frankfurt the Frankfurt, Frankfurt School were the Frankfurt School were mostly German Jews who left Berlin in thirty three, but they had they had founded a, a department at Frankfurt uh, at, at, at the University of Frankfurt, and the, like Walter Benjamin was part of that, Hochheimer was part of that. Uh, uh, I was talk about California. Uh, Oh God, oh God, I've just, Eros and uh, Herbert Marcuse was a big of the part of the Frankfurt School that came out to San Diego. Uh, they were uh, really interested in kind of politics, the, the political realm of everything that kind of, and, and, and how politics shapes the world. And they were all Marxists. It was a kind of neo-Marxist thing. And they, they really, they, they hated anything dealing with religion. I mean, as a Catholic, they were, Catholics were demonized the most. Uh, they, they really thought that uh, they, so that when they came in, uh, I mean, Adorno wrote all of these things against occultism. I mean, his funniest book was the one I've written about called Stars Down to Earth, where he says that if people read the Los Angeles Times astrology co column, they're getting fascist directives. I mean, it was pretty, and, and they, they came to California too. You had uh, Marcuse and then you had uh, Wertmeister, but- You know, what uh, strikes me about this kind of the influences that that has had on um, just kind of like our general cultural biases and understanding is it's actually really racist because um, it's so dismissive of any of the indigenous beliefs, which, you know, to me, generally, and, and these are people all over the world from the Sami and the Arctic to indigenous people in the Americas, the mystic and the mysteries are, are really combined with the physical life. There's not compartmentalized like, oh, that's this. And, and not to say that everybody was a shaman. I mean, that's a, that's a misconception too, of course, if there were people that have that skill in the tribe, then they would fulfill that role. And there are other people that had a more physical uh, orientation to reality, but they didn't dismiss um, certain ideologies. And so, you know, a lot of the, the biases that we're breaking through, people don't realize that people who don't want to think that they're racist at all, it's actually very racist to dismiss mysticism. <laughs> um, the were very, very Eurocentric. Um, and I mean, my specialty used to be Native American. I, I was actually born in a tuberculosis sanitarium for Navajos in between Boulder and Estes Park. So I grew up with, I grew up in Santa Fe and, uh, and Boulder. So I grew up with a lot of Native American friends. But I think that for me, that was what really influenced my life was I, as a child, I was going to things like before they closed it to white people, things like the the snake dance on the Hopi Mesa, I was going out to see the Shalako. Um, I was going to those tribe, uh, 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 all of those tribal celebrations and dances. And uh, I also had a lot of Native American friends. My school was probably 20% Native American, uh, uh, maybe 30% Anglo and 50% Hispanic. Uh, so I, I, being around Native Americans really changed the way that I saw the, the world and coming into art history from Native American archaeology really I couldn't I didn't care I couldn't have cared less about the New York school I was much more interested in in reading about the Hopi snake dance or Hopi prophecy than I was about reading about the New York school so I think that 
for me, that was a great entry point into another way of looking at art. I thought that what the quack Udal or what the tinglet, or we don't call them that anymore, but what that, that the Northwest Coast Indians had much more interesting ideas about art than the New York school. Well, I think that we talked about this in the last talk with Edgar um, Pieperberts, who I'm sure you know, he's been around a long time. But, you know, there's an, in my research for the show and also just I've been spending time in New Mexico, I've just come across a, a real wealth of, in, of uh, American indigenous artists working in contemporary art. So I just see a real shift going on everywhere. You know, the old set, the old patriarchal structure, it's very strongly ingrained in everything, but I, I see these huge leaps and uh, infiltrations <laughs> into the, you know, the- Philosophically, almost all of the big art, uh, philosophical schools surrounding art, things like the Frankfurt School, the New York School, all of those have been founded by and dominated by men. And it's interesting, what was interesting about Hilma of Clint is, I mean, she was, uh, she had rejected, she'd had a big fight with Rudolf Steiner and had kind of left his, that fold, but she was, she was also kind of a, a theorist. She did amazing, thousands and thousands of pages of critical writing. Uh, what I look forward to is knowing more about her. I really want to know more about the process. And I can post, I have to find it. It's, I, there, are there are books of her writing. Her writing is now being published slowly because there are millions of pages of it. And it has to be published, translated from the Swedish. But a lot of that writing is coming out now. And as we get more of it, it's going to be even more interesting. It's going to be really good. So we are, uh, it's already 1250 and I'm not sure how that happened, but anyway, you know, time flies when you're having a good time. So I'm going to, um, and I want to, I want to come back to a point where we can all uh, participate at the same time and, and talk to each other, but I'm going to move to Edgar, um, Fabian Frias. And I have a couple um, kind of burning questions for you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're on speaker view. So are you un, un, unmiked? Yes. Okay. So one of my questions is I, I listened to an interview and you said you've grown up in a religious household. Um, and I was wondering what the process for you of um, uh, finding or was it already present in your family through uh, kind of customs and just beliefs, but finding your your indigenous culture uh, coming coming out of a religious household that didn't preach, you know, those spiritual beliefs. What was the process for you of tuning into that? Were there relatives that were already connected to it? Or like I said, you know, things within your family that were very indigenous, uh, historical kind of beliefs that kind of seeped in? Or did you just kind of like go download into it or read about it or, you know, what's been that process of reclaiming that? What has that been like for you? Yeah, um, it's definitely been a journey. Um, I would say I started, you know, growing up as a Jehovah's Witness. So I was very much indoctrinated in this like cult-like atmosphere in many ways. Um, and um, it wasn't until I studied abroad. I went abroad to England to do my art practice um, program. And it was there that I actually got woken up in the middle of the night by my ancestors who like had like a message for me. And it was essentially that I was a medicine person. And at that time I was in an art program, you know, finishing up my second bachelor's. And so I was like, what does this mean? Like how, how do I integrate this, you know, knowledge that I'm receiving um, with the reality, right? That I'm in capitalism, I'm in this art program. And so I think a lot of that was definitely like a big impetus that really started to kind of moved me in a journey of kind of trying to figure out how does, how do I interpret that for myself? And, and it wasn't until honestly, I would say about um, three years ago that I finally had a conversation with my father where he told us about our indigenous ancestors. And that's a whole other story that also has involves dreams and messages. And so I'm definitely someone who receives messages and has been guided by my ancestors. So, um, and you know, that's definitely become integrated in my work now where I 
um, continue to work with my ancestors and I've you know, been learning different ancestral practices. And I also support other people in working with divination and altered states of consciousness um, and also being able to build those connections that many of them have been um, you know, hurt by because of colonization. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think it's so, you know, there was so much that was lost. This is the biggest genocide that's ever happened. Um, and so culture and people are fleeing and there's trauma. And so how do you, how do you save these, these uh, precious teachings and so forth? But I know um, I'm a person of mixed ancestry and I know for me, I grew up in the hippie back to nature subculture. So I always was taught to listen in inwardly. Um, and so it's just what one thing I recognized in you and I thought was interesting is you really seem like also a product of Southern California multicultural spirituality, as well as having this deep, you know, kind of listening and, and reclaiming your ancestral spiritual practices. And, you know, it's almost like except for places where the culture is so um, intact that that's that's kind of you know we're all we're coming to to a place together I think is what I'm trying to say it's like a, a message of unity um, but how do you feel when I mean you know psychics come in all cultures right you know and people who have the gift to hear and and you know someone else may be good at sports or mathematics or whatever or some people are gifted more in the spiritual and so how do you connect with people that are non-Indigenous um, in terms of, I know you do a lot of group ritual practices and, and then you combine it with psychotherapy, which is so interesting. Um, and uh, the mind-body medicine, the, the, the different focuses of your degree. Um, how, do you, how do you guide people to themselves without feeling like you're, you're overstepping into your culture or appropriating or, you know, where do you how do you, you know, do you feel like a multicultural person? You know, how do you, how do you approach all that? Yeah, I definitely feel like a multicultural person. You know, I do feel like I have my own like indigenous uh, ritual and ceremony. And also I have learned so much from the feminist community, the queer and trans communities, the Southern California communities. You know, it, it's interesting because, um, you know, when I was abroad in England, that's when I first met like radical kind of queer and trans witches. And it was the first time I started connecting with like paganism and the occult. Um, and it wasn't until also um, coming back to Southern California because I lived in Oregon for a while and I lived in the Bay Area. And then I lived in Los Angeles and it was there that I finally was like, oh my gosh, there's so many artists and witches and healers and mystics and people who are like traversing so many realms. And that was finally so validating because I had, you know, for a long time really felt that like Western colonialist idea of like, I have to be either a therapist or an artist. I have to figure out what I'm doing with my life. Um, and I feel like finally, I think letting go of that and really kind of realizing that my own ancestors did not separate art and, and healing and, um, you know, all the practices that I traverse, like those are all part of the same space. Um, and I wanted to speak a little bit to what Anne was saying, because um, I think, you know, one thing I've definitely in my graduate program, I'm, I'm already seeing a little bit of resistance to me bringing in spirituality and- I was wondering, bringing... that was my next question is how has that looked for you in your generation? Well, one thing that's been really healing and so powerful for me was then in Southern California, I was a part of this school called the Golden Dome School. And they're a school that really works with mysticism and that really integrates um, different types of practices into creative practice. And so I feel like I've already been a part of like a, a community of people who, a lot of people who have come from the art world and have been like, I was made fun of people, you know, told me I was insane and people like laughed at my artwork. And, you know, we've built a community where we like support one another and really support ourselves in, you know, both developing as artists and also developing our intuitive, our, you know, our abilities to connect with ourselves and each other. And so that's been really kind of resourcing to kind of enter now into back into academia. Uh, knowing that I have all that. And so that's been really helpful to kind of be able to stay, stand in my power and to, you know, um, yeah, really speak about things that are important to me, even though I know sometimes I can kind of witness from some of the, 
yeah, people in my program who are like either confused or like, oh, wow, like you're working. And especially I think the way, as you were saying earlier, Monet, my, my art, my spirituality many times can be funny or confusing. Um, and that also, I think sometimes could be like jarring for people. Like I think it's supposed to look like you're going, oh, or something, you know, it's like, it's in all, you know, any great shaman is like a joker, you know, or the, they play, you know, the coyote, they play the, you know, they, they play tricks to get you to wake up, right? You know, it's not all about sitting and meditating. And, yeah. So they, you know, you, you, you come in and you shock them. I mean, I think art, we talked about this last time about how art can be, can shock you into um, uh, awarenesses that you weren't aware of before. And, and, and so art in itself to me is this liminal space um, that can be very mystical without ever being half, half you know, have to be na na naming it that. Um, but yeah, I was wondering if you were, if you experienced um, biases in the art world um, coming from where you've been coming from, if that's been, uh, I mean, it has have galleries, have, you know, I mean, it, it seems like you kind of have just created this space and this is what you do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I definitely would say I do get like, you know, criticism or questions or confusion. Um, you know, I think one of the things I, I guess, you know, I, I, my background's in counseling, right? And I studied interpersonal neurobiology, which is a neuroimaging research-based field that looks at kind of holographic um, paradigms. And just because of that, and because it's not going along with mechanistic paradigms, um, a lot of people see it as like an invalid field. And so even in that field, which is not like a witchy field, it's a science field, even in that space, I also have had to kind of in a way validate or feel like the system is kind of not like, you know, understanding where you're coming from. Um, and so as an artist, I would definitely would say I have had some either criticism or questions, but for the most part, I think as a therapist, I've had to learn how to speak with people who have all sorts of spiritual beliefs. So that's really helped me to find ways to translate or communicate what my intention is um, in ways that maybe I feel like a curator or, you know, uh, a person working in a music festival or, or whatever it is that I'm engaging in will uh, be able to understand it. Flexibility. Some of the works that I really enjoyed looking at on your website, um, one of them was, is it Angel US, where you go around uh, Echo Park, the lake? Yeah. And I, you know, and also Give Us Home Spider, that one that I felt was really powerful. And so what Edgar's doing is, um, uh, really like looking at the landscape, it seems to me from a, um, a reclaiming and a healing and healing the land, healing the earth and recognizing what was there before um, from an indigenous perspective. I really like that kind of going out into spaces. And there was another one uh, on a ceremonial sweat lodge site that uh, was the indigenous uh, Los Angeles area. Indeed, the so Tungva, yeah. The Tungva, you did a, a like a therapy sessions, like one on one. You just go <laughs> two chairs, and it's just out in this like like wasteland looking area. But this was a site that was very important in like reclaiming the site for the purpose so that it was meant to be originally. I, that, that stuff's really powerful to me. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I definitely, I feel like, I think, you know, as you're naming, I think art is one of those spaces that's still really open to creating possibilities through capitalism to connect and also to kind of reconnect with our ancestral, um, the legacies that are still very much present here with us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm really happy with the contribution you made for the show. Um, Edgar has a piece in Gallery 3, along with Anne, you're right next to each other, and then Linda, actually, the three of you, uh, and um, stressing the sacredness of all life, including plants and our mineral kin and animals, and, um, you know, it's such a kind of uh, basic foundational Indigenous perspective from, again, people all over the world who are Indigenous, not just people in the Americas and with all the diversity of, uh, you know, native people in Americas, it's like going from Germany to France to Switzerland, you know, there, there was different nations, right? People sometimes think it's this one thing, but I do find this common thread of uh, respecting the sanctity of life. And, you know, like they were always green from the very beginning. <laughs> they were environmentally minded. So Definitely. I, 
I appreciate that you're um, allowing that to come through. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it feels important. It feels important to bring it in. Um, right. Yeah, and I think one thing I've learned in the Golden Dome School, Eliza Swan, who's the person who founded the school, she said something that has been really powerful for me, which is animism is an antidote to capitalism. Oh. And that has just like really sat with me. Wow. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and it's definitely returning to those indigenous, you know, roots that we many of us have, right? That many of us from all over the world have that our ancestors really honored and spoke with and connected and communed with the land and all the living beings on the earth. Yeah. Yeah, I always try to kind of figure out where did this start, you know, because in Europe there's, you know, lots of traditions of of uh, respecting nature um, and understanding the aliveness and the sentience and speaking to the plants. Like the Welsh have an incredible history um, of this and they were colonized by the, the English who were trying to shut them down for being, you know, the, when, where did this start, the shutdown of like, you're not allowed to listen to your intuition and, you know, that you're primitive if you think that nature's alive. And then now what's happening is science is catching up with indigenous belief and it's happening all over. Um, right. You know, all kinds of, all kinds of fields are proving things mystics have said and things that indigenous people have said. So this whole idea of positivism in the Frankfurt School, it's just, it's, it's on its way out because they want to base everything on science. Well, science is already bringing the goods back to them. <laughs> so, yes. um, but there's a balance, you know, I think that it's very important to be in the, your body in the physical world and not get um, lost in the spiritual, like it, there's a balance, you know, I'm never saying that one or the other is more important. It's just that we've negated a whole side of ourselves. Um, right, and, de and denigrated, right? And put placed yeah. hierarchies, because I think that that's it's like also, mind. exactly. And yeah, and I think that that's what is changing. And I'm so, so inspired to see that changing more and more. Yeah. And people holding their ground and being in their power around this. Yeah. All right. Um, like I said, we will come back around. Um, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, let's speak with Darren. Aaron Martin. Oh, we have a little clip. Okay. I want to show a little piece of R3 before we talk about your, your latest work. Um, just because I love it so much. And I want you to tell us what the heck was going on there. <laughs> Brad has to share a screen. Well, at this point, I think we're chanting things. It's been a long, it's been a while since I looked at this. Um, so since we don't have the sound, <laughs> I think it's a, it's a rebirthing ceremony is happening here. Um, and actually the person inside there right now uh, came as a virus. Basically in this, in this workshop, um, when we hit, were working with Crow's work, um, we did something really different where we um, kind of gave over some of the, direction of the workshop to people that we brought in. Um, so Beatrice Thomas and Kevin Seaman, who are um, both really uh, active and uh, interesting artists in, in like the queer San Francisco um, community, uh, theater community came in and they uh, helped guide this uh, performance. So it was a, a kind of rebirthing. and. What we, the only instruction we asked, we, you know, just kind of put a big call out to uh, a network of people. And the only instruction was that they would come in some way dressed as um, uh, something that they want to channel into uh, an ancestor of, that could be um, from the, uh, from any world, uh, but the natural world. And, um, and Farley, who was in the bubble just now is, was channeling of, a virus, uh, ironically, this, um, and there were, you know, then we also had some props and like um, various animal outfits. And uh, so they, um, we, we use this kind of inflatable bubble <clears throat> as uh, a space that one could physically 
be be altered and turn and and we had these uh, these these kind of chants or mantras that were guided by Beatrice and Kevin um, that uh, helped us in some way um, transform or, or, or call upon uh, the ancestor that was uh, chosen by that person to um, be brought forth uh, in, in that moment. So uh, we had, yeah, we had that and the, the earlier slide where people are kind of in these flesh suits, um, that was a a guided workshop by Torsten, who's my collaborator, Torsten Zenas Burns. Um, his brother is uh, Christian Burns, is a choreographer uh, in the Bay Area that um, we, for that workshop, uh, he guided people through, um, we, we actually, we supplied all the, the kind of flesh suits and um, he guided people through these um, kind of movement based, um, exercises uh, where actually the most memorable one for me is where we oh it was one of these like big um first friday oakland art events so the whole group of us went out and uh it crowded on the streets yeah like, looked on the streets and, and he asked that everyone find a gesture to teach the group so everyone's just like kind of we're all just looking out and finding something that could be an everyday movement or you know a slight um, sleight of hand, any, anything uh, in, in this very busy um, street life moment and then teach each other and, and kind of make it part of a, a, a dance or choreography. And I mean, speaking of ancestors, um, well, first of all, I just wanted, I'm on the unceded ancestral homeland of um, the Olani peoples in Oakland, right? And uh, I just wanna um, uh, give some credence to that. Um, but Torsen and I, um, <clears throat> and kind of weaving it into this kind of idea of ancestry, I think we had this really bonding moment <laughs> of, uh, as undergrads, um, we've been working together for a very long time, uh, up in upstate New York, um, we went on a field trip <clears throat> from Alfred University to University of Buffalo, where there was this big, they turned the, a, a few buildings there into these like installations and, um, and they had screenings and, uh, <clears throat> one of the films that really just kind of spoke to us was Eden Velez's Dance of Darkness, which is a really powerful film about, um, about Budo uh, and, um, and, and that Japanese, uh, now tradition, but Japanese kind of avant-garde dance movement that was really uh, considering ways in which um, to speak to um, and, and channel through ancestral um, uh, ancestors through the body. And, and Buto was like- And ghosts you know, of those who had died in the Hiroshima bombing. Yeah, and it's also very tied to the earth um, and to the feminine. Um, there's uh, Buto, I think it's, it's in, in some loose translation, like earth, earth dance. And um, there, uh, yeah, there are, uh, you know, some of the, <clears throat> Well, there's, there are many different branches and groups, but um, two of the, the main pioneers. Um, one, one was a farmer kind of channeling that kind of rural energy um, and, and, and connecting it to uh, people's connection to the land. And another um, was really interested in kind of channeling the feminine and um, an Argentinian dancer. Um, whose name I'm, yeah. But anyway, the, um, so there's, there's that kind of, um, that kind of bond was, was in our uh, very, you know, um, beginnings of our friendship or beginnings of our collaborations. And in some ways, you know, your choice to show those particular moments uh, really speak to those and, and speak to some things that I've been thinking about a lot as well. Well, it just, it, it, it just as far as kind of the subject of the show, there was this um, primal, altered state of consciousness uh, in action that was, you know, that that was happening through the whole process of that, you know, the series of making it. I mean, you guys, you guys go really deep or really out there, which, whichever way you want to say, really in or really out, but it's, you know, it has a, um, you know, it, in terms of body performance and uh, the different states that you, you uh, achieve in yourself, and then it transmits through the work. You know, so it feels it feels akin to a shamanic practice. Um, it felt therapeutic 
I know that I was watching when everyone was diving into the pod and the people that were in it were not really accessible to the people who weren't because they were so in it, you know? There was <laughs> such a, you were like, hey, and they're like, oh, you know, they were like diving in and you couldn't even like connect because you were in like different dimensions, you know? So you made a portal, you know? Yeah, well, that the, the ceremony we tried, you know, had that clip too where you, I, now I'm remembering what we were, some of some of the chants, like one was like arrive, 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 arrive. And I remember this one time, I think it was with the um with Farley there as the virus. Um we you know shake him up and then like because it will happen in a small room, there's also an inability for everyone to feel like an audience. They're like peeking in this door, you know, and um, but I think we spilled Farley out out the door and almost like ejected him out of the um out of the circle in a sense uh, to be born. Um, and I think that happened to, yeah. uh, but not everybody, but yeah, that was part of the, okay. the ceremony. I really wanna talk about this work that I missed at Soma Arts and just, um, but see now I don't know if we're gonna be able to see the sound, but um, can you just bring up the, I mean, I have it here, I can share screen, but. Um, There's a little button you can click to share sound from your computer when you share the screen. See, the millennials have to tell us how to do these things. Okay, joking. Sure. Share computer sound. You're so smart. Okay, there's the one. Share. Okay. So um, tell us, walk us through this piece. So I was left. No, don't quite hear it. Um, but I was left, um, been left. Oh, there it is. Hear the pitch, the tone. So it, it reminds me of what like a hearing aid might sound like. Yeah. Yeah. So I've been left um, a series of you know, like a number of hearing aids from um, people who've uh, passed on to my family, like you know uncles would give me my grandfather's hearing aids, or you know. And the funny thing is, in some of them were like, um, oh, here. Maybe you can use these without knowing that a lot of the hearing aids are folded to your specific ear, or, you know? So it's not like you can just pop them in and be like, yeah. And they're also programmed for your specific um, type of loss. Uh, so uh, the, um, but then they were sitting around for a long time at, at my collection, uh, not only from my family, also some from some artist friends who've passed. Um, and, and those people had given me them or, them, um, meaning because they thought I could use it in my art rather than my ears. So, um, but eventually, yeah, after using like 14, 15 of these things, um, I activated them in this piece um, where it's just the synchronized projections of the wall are these rather, you know, um, Kind of epic or sometimes forest like landscapes. They're shot in both, um, well, in upstate New York where I grew up in the summertime when it's lush and green, and then also in the spring uh, in California uh, between the Bay Area and Davis, where I often do this commute. Um, and at this time of year, I'm always just like, still to this day, uh, taken aback by the like kind of lush green hills, which are so different than um, back east, which are often very um, wooded. So um, I had the, these projections are silent and I chose to close caption all the environmental sound, including the feedback sound that comes from um, that gesture of my hand coming in from uh, any of the sides of the frame and cupping or holding. Um, these hearing aids. And depending on the aid, you know, they, they all make different kinds of sounds. Um, they produce different kinds of feedback. Um, I was inter interested in this idea of, um, in some ways, inverting the purpose of this technology, which uh, hear, uh, or amplify sound for those with less hearing. But, um, and then think about it as an instrument or something that is giving voice something. Um, and then inside the headsets was um, stereoscopic video uh, where I did and the interiors um, kind of play with uh, 
And there was again play with the hearing aid that are uh, cupped in glasses. Like also thinking about this kind of, you know, the glass harp where people play these wine glasses, the eerie kind of also like pitched um, music. And the sound would bleed into the, into the environment. There are these unsynchronized headsets. So, you know, people would, um, the, you know, the reason it's like that is it's, you know, kind of 3D stereoscopy. Um, but the uh, interest in that kind of the bleeding between this interior space and this exterior space with these kind of, you know, similar play and gesture, um, this, uh, which I'm always very curious of, I, well, I have been curious about, especially since um, my, my hearing loss, I don't know, you know, when you get audio, audiology exams and they're always testing you with tones, beep, 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 yeah. right? Uh, those pure tones are very similar to the sound I have in my head called tinnitus, which is um, kind of a common phenomenon where you have this ringing, constant ringing in your head. So um, that, that blurring between interior and exterior, am I, you know, am I producing the sensation or is that a sensation from the outside? Um, especially around hearing, you know, has always intrigued me, you know, how we uh, sometimes hear our names, but our names was never, were never called. Um, there's um, that, that, that space of um, what is one, you know, it's also our thoughts, you know, am I really perceiving this or seeing this or am I kind of making this up? You know, sometimes um, we have to kind of seek out what, um, uh, what might be just some kind of weird feedback loop pattern and affirm it as, as real. I mean, my tinnitus is real. It's a phenomenon that's actually, you know, being generated by me, um, mm -hmm. but so is the tone that is being, you know, sent to me and, and um, um, I'm asked to respond to. So um, on the larger scale, I was thinking in ancestral songs <clears throat> about the interior, the interiority and, and safety of a home um, versus these kind of like majestic beauty and, um, and space and openness of a landscape and, um, and having that, you know, sometimes the closed captions are talking about these sounds that are um, very much like that, that feedback sound that is emanating from the, um, the headsets themselves. Um, so that, that sound is, is the kind of the thing that is in some ways blurring the, the binary. Um, in a weird way, I'm setting up a very um, uh, stark binary, but another, in another way, I'm also uh, you know, kind of questioning that. Like even within the headsets, there's also the, the sound of this traffic that kind of emanates and comes into um, uh, into uh, the, the sound of the headsets themselves, which is very much recognizable as the sound of a, you know, a car passing and the reverberation of a car passing in a valley. Um, so then, you know, even within that interior experience of the headsets, there's this idea of something, something's pulling you out um, outside the window that you may not even, you know, see as a window at that point. Um, so yeah, it's that, it's that place. Um, well, I've lost all hearing in the side of my right side. And I have a bone anchored hearing aid that um, that basically is an amplifier that's uh, embedded, you know, that put is it put on a screw that's embedded in my skull that sends sound vibrations through this th screw through my skull to my healthy inner ear on the other side. And now I have a middle ear problem on this side. So I mean, I, I get, you know, I get around fine. Um, and um, here in, in, in many environments, but I also experience I've also been kind of attuned to acoustics of space in ways that I had, I hadn't before. Um, uh, before this condition uh, has reoriented my perceptions. So, um, but then a relationship with sound, like thinking about that. Um, well, in the ancestral songs, I'll just say for a little bit more is like, kind of <clears throat> some many of the people who I inherited these hearing aids from, um, in some ways were quieted by their, um, by their experience of deafness or hearing loss. Um, in, cause a lot of times I saw them in large social gatherings, which when you have a lot of people talking, it can be very um, disorienting um, for, for folks trying to negotiate that space. And so um, I feel like, you know, for me, the gesture is also kind of giving voice to those beyond and those who've been quieted um, in their own deafness. Um, the, um, 
uh, I'm also, you know, also thinking about the land and, and who, you know, who, who is the song to? Who are the ancestors of the land? Um, I think about, uh, you know, the upstate New York um, space I, I come from, when, you know, and, um, and my family have um, uh, immigrated because of the, many of them, because of the Irish potato famine. <laughs> so that, you know, there was a, actually something that happened to the land that um, forced them to try to find lives somewhere else. And, and then also then coming to this land, this like the idea and the mythology of like the West and the wilderness, right? Like this, you know, and this open expanse um, that's even like part of the manifest destiny crap that, you know, we've been fed in, in our own history. Um, but, uh, but thinking like, who is, who is the song for and, and who is, you know, uh, and so, so, so there in ancestry gets blurred, I feel like, um, blurred with, you know, my own, uh, my own inheritance and then these other, you know, things that are larger, larger than me and larger than our history that we know and, and environmental in some way. Sensitive um, to the, I mean, I think that's part of the turning point that, you know, we've been going through different generations but being sensitive to the the ancestry but what we've all inherited as americans um you know this this whole uh melting pot of trauma and genocide and stealing land and and creating something amazing out of it all i think we've created an amazing country in a lot of ways it has many problems and, and there's a lot to fix but you know, we kind of have all. I mean, I'm a, I'm a person of three ans three different. Uh, I don't like to say races because all humans are one race. But anyway, three different ancestral lines that are very different. And um, when I think of ancestors, it's just I almost just want to say that you know our ancestors are um, our genetic ancestors, but we all have kind of inherited this this um, multicultural landscape and i feel like you're very sensitive to that you know a very influential moment for me was going to india as an undergrad and um and i was really interested in world religions and i um i you know was studying uh yantras and and um and um tantric uh tantric hinduism and uh, this this idea that um, there's kind of there are these different kind of uh, I hate to say representation representations because sometimes they are that um, but like de of deity right like the grossest being like you know the this the statue of of Shiva is one manifestation of Shiva but then there's a, a you know then there's these geometric paintings that become this kind of almost closer to divination then there's a mantra and it's actually sound that's almost like the purest connection the purest thing and i i think about sound and vibration and its potency uh as something that could potentially heal um and you know did for us at the beginning right it just drops you right into a, a i was dropped into a meditative state yeah, yeah. sound has that potential yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much i want to ask the audience if anybody wants to ask a question, and before we go into our closing song with Linda, and you can type it out, if anybody, oh, huh? Or raise their hand. Or raise their hand. Oh, we have a, uh, yes, animism. <laughs> That's a comment. Um, Someone's talked about the Inquisition killing witches and strong women was the beginning of the European disconnect. Oh, there is no sound. Is there still no sound? This is at 109. Oh, I think that was when, maybe you, maybe, maybe you were playing my, the, that first example of the workshop. Yeah, that one, okay. I had a question about, or really, like the, going back to that Frankfurt school, I, did, I don't wanna, <laughs> I don't know, I, I feel like, there, there was an amazing place for them. I mean, in a way that they shook up, um, like in some ways, some of those thinkers really um, made the, the student riots and the kind of anti-war movement. It, in, in some ways, it, those thinkers really kind of fueled that. In fact, like Angela Davis cites Herbert Marcuse as like 
a central teacher that allowed her to understand how to be an activist, a revolutionary, a scholar, um, and to be all these things and not just I'm this one thing. And yes, I mean, absolutely. Eurocentric, their um, dismissive uh, dismission of, of around religion or spiritualism um, is, is um, a, yeah, very ignorant. But I feel like that their role in, in our their, their history, and especially when I look like Angela Davis is such a hero, thinking about um, uh, her stance around civil rights and, um, and the unfair practice of um, incarceration and the military industrial complex and how those things, you know, they are tied to some of, um, you know, some of the concerns around spiritualism and, and some of the ideas that, you know, we like to, to think are akin or we're holding hands with. Um, some of those ideas. So I, I feel like, you know, um, they're not, yeah, I, it was hard to just dis dismiss them entirely and not see the importance of the role. Um, I, in well, I mean, you had, you know, a huge history of protest uh, uh, with labor, et cetera, in America going back for, going back, you know, to the Civil War. I mean, and also an anti-war movement. I wasn't, Yes, the, the political contribution of the Frankfurters is important. The part that is not so hot is that there's a huge power shadow to this. Yeah. And it's the, like it's like this huge power shadow to Marxism. And that is like, for example, I'm writing a lot on Agnes Pelton the, and the mystics, the mm -hmm. mystic painters. And all of them came out of Kandinsky and the cosmos and that whole mystical tradition in Russia. Well, what happened when the Bolsheviks came in and the Marxists came in is anybody who didn't embrace a total doctrine of dialectical materialism, anybody who was interested in spiritualism, in the occult, in religion, even formal religion, all of those people, I mean, all of those people like Paval Florensky, even, uh, uh, you know, all of those people were ended up either in a gulag or with a bullet in the back of the head. And the problem with the Marxist thing is that you also have a huge power shadow where there is no room for any kind of counter position. Right. And it, it's a huge power shadow. I mean, I remember I was in, I was in Switzerland I was staying in uh, Pontresina and I'd met Herbert Marcuse in Berlin earlier where he was, you know, having dinner and I get to Pontresina and I, there's a huge hotel there. It's like Le Grand Hotel. You know, it's the most expensive hotel in Europe. And there's Herbert Marcuse staying in the hotel. So there was a huge power shadow to all of that. And unfortunately, I wouldn't have cared if they had their position. I wouldn't have cared if that was their contribution. But my problem with it was the power shadow where no other points of view were allowed. And it was not only that these other points of view were were not allowed. It was that the people were deplatformed, they were fired, they couldn't publish, they were shut down. And that's the problem when you are, you have, it's a problem we're seeing now with cancel culture and the whole woke thing is that what, what I think ideally you need what the Indians call anakantavad, where you have multiple perspectives and, and you honor that tradition of multiple perspectives. And that is the piece that I think we're really missing right now. It's it's a Jane. It's actually a Jane philosophical uh, yeah. idea. The quote that I said, I'm, I'm going to paraphrase that Joseph Boyce speaking of him again, uh, that I used in my last in the in the last talk. Um, that you know, he said, "I'm not I'm not interested." And it's in a film by one of the artists in the show, John Deleva Halpern, who made a film about Boyce. Um, I, he said he wasn't he wasn't interested in in uh, disavowing the physical world or the the mechanical perspective of the universe. He just wants to include the esoteric and the energetic and the mystic. So you know, I think what we've had is just this, and like you said, it's a power structure of an imbalance, and it's kind of the nature of human beings, right? They get in these. Oh my God! I mean, uh, Benjamin Buflo wrote the definitive. It's the worst piece of writing I've ever seen on Joseph Boys. It's called the twilight of the idols where he basically just completely dismisses boys and it's so sad because boys was 
I think Boyce was such a great force. I mean, he was really interesting as a person too. I mean, I met him in, through James Lee Byers in Berlin and he was, I, it was, he was fascinating because he was, um, you know, I don't even care if his whole thing in the Crimea was a fairy tale or a myth. A myth. You could, I don't know what happened to Boyce, but something happened to Boyce. He still had metal plates in his skull and- He was altered, he had a near death Thing. Yeah, he was altered. And when you saw his face, he had scars. And when you saw his face, this was a man who had walked into the bowels of hell and come back out again. This was a man who had gone through some then, incredible transformational experience. Jennifer Locke has asked us a question for Anne. Um, Jennifer Locke is in our exhibition um, in Gallery 2. She says, what is the term that Anne just used about a dialogue involving multiple viewpoints? You said, okay, oh. it's called anaconda. It's called anaconda. Where, I, what, what language? What, it's, a, it's, it's, uh, God, I can run over and get the book. It's, it's a huge Indian philosophical tradition. It comes out of Jainism, J-A-I-N. It, mm -hmm. It's a Jain doctrine. It's called anaconda or anaconda vad. I think it's A-N-A-K-A-N-T-A-V-A-D or an Anaconta. Um, it's spelled, I've seen it spelled several different ways. I can, I, the book is like a mile across my studio in a bookcase. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's discussed a lot in Thomas McEvely's book, The Shape of Ancient Thought. He has two chapters on it. It's a very interesting, I, I, think, it's, I think it's probably the most interesting way of seeing the world. It's as though all ideas and thought are sort of this huge transparent globe, and we each represent a point on that globe. And according to Anaconda, it, the, it's called the doctrine of multiple perspectives. Each point on the globe is interesting. And say you represent a point on the globe and I represent another, both of those points are equally valid, and we have to honor other points of view as having validity, not just our own. And that's the huge point we're missing right now with cancel culture and all of this shutting down and all of this shutting down where you can't have, you, uh, I mean, you can't say this or you can't say that, or you can't think this or you can't think that. I think that is that has been a, one of the, that has been part of the shadow of Marxism is this idea of this censorship and I mean, you get it in other kinds of, of doctrines too. You know, the, Brad you looked get... it up and spelled it in the in the uh, chat. <laughs> oh, you did? okay, okay. There you go. Okay, I was okay. Great. I've seen it spelled like about four different ways, but that'll do the job. Jennifer says, "Thank you, Anne. I agree with you about cancel culture. It's getting fundamentalist." Jennifer is the department chair at of performance video, now called New Genres. It's so funny. I just quit That's teaching AI. at Yale last semester because I, 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 for several reasons. One is I didn't want to go up there, but one of it was I felt like it was starting to feel like I was teaching under Joseph Stalin. You know, where I was. I'm an Irish irreverent. You know, I'm a total irreverent. And I, and I, I couldn't stand teaching and being terrified every night when I went home of, oh, fuck, what did I say now kind of feeling. It's a healing crisis. And in, in holistic uh, theory and holistic medicine, the healing crisis is you get worse before you get better. So I think we're, you know, we're in a period, but it's good to be able to talk about. We have another comment from Christine Shields. She's also in the exhibition. She has a painting and does the music for uh, a video um, called Animals Eat the Sky, which is stunning. Um, she says, thank you all for your work. I've been an an on, on an animistic path since childhood that was totally not accepted in art school and caused me to fracture aspects of creativity and isolate them and not talk about my work. Hearing you all talk and sing is so powerful. I appreciate, appreciate it so much. So again, kind of giving voice to these uh, oppressed <laughs> yeah and, and and I definitely would say that like in a lot of the work that I've done as a psychotherapist and also as someone who facilitates workshops and events I love normalizing that you know that people do have conversations with plants and animals because it is something that has that happens so much but I feel like a lot of people are shamed out of it or are made to feel like it's not something that really should be brought in. And I think <clears throat> divination practices have a long tradition of being woven into creative practices. And for me, um, communion with other species is definitely a divination or divinatory or communal practice that I feel like 
um, I'm really excited to see a lot more people bringing into their art practices. That's why I wanted to- The sad things is in graduate programs, uh, critics took over the programs. Critics founded things like the Whitney program so that they were there. It was a power thing where they thought we'll have the theory and then we'll tell artists what to do. And I think then in a way, uh, one of the best things we could do would be to get we get rid of all MFA programs for a while, and, and I think that it's it's created a kind of monster, and the art has gotten deader and deader too. Uh, it's sad. I mean, I think that 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 people really need to sort of start bringing them their art out of themselves. I I was talking. I I do a lot of work on the on for uh, on an artist named William Kentridge, and Kentridge was telling me that he thought that the only thing that saved him was being in South Africa and never going to art school. He, he, he was studied to be a mime. And then he uh, studied uh, and studied printmaking. He, did, he studied at a printmaking workshop and drawing, studied to be a mime and worked in television and filmmaking. And he said that what really saved him, that he was so glad that he hadn't been in New York where he'd been you know, influenced by the New York school or told what to do. He was influenced by black artists, someone he called the uh, Goya of Soweto. So I think that- you know, in Africa, there's some, I lived in South Africa and I remember looking at art in America when I was living there and going, that looks like the deadest, like there's no energy in this magazine. There's nothing, it looked dead because all the work I was seeing all around me was so alive and so magical and so imbued with spirituality just busting out of everywhere. And I'm talking about contemporary art. I saw a lot of contemporary art, African contemporary art from Africans. And, um, and it, was, it was amazing because it hadn't lost what we're talking about in this talk. It hadn't lost the, the spiritual, the subconscious, the dream, the culture, the, the mystic, you know, it was the animis, animism, you know, the, the sentience of nature. It hadn't lost any of that. And they were also still um, showing in galleries that would take them to Europe and participating in a contemporary art context. It felt very balanced. It was really exciting. I didn't stay because I, I was thinking to live there. And then they said, we'll never show you. We'll never show a, you know, an American. <laughs> I'm like, I'll never have an art career. But they have so many African artists, you know. I know, you know, uh, just, the two programs I've taught at, we, I, I don't, I mean, I can just speak for myself. I experienced ideas around spirituality and spiritualism that I feel like we're not repressed or squashed. In fact, I, I first learned of Hilmolf Klimt um, through a grad student at UC Davis, like years before the Guggenheim show, and was super excited and appreciative that um, that she brought me to her, uh, you know, brought that to my her work to my attention. So. Um, Maybe it's, yeah, because those are programs that are artists run by artists. I know like, you know, Whitney program, like, yeah, I'm sure lots of programs that might get tethered with theorists and entangled. You know. it started by, yeah, people like Benjamin Buchla started the Whitney program. I mean, it's, yeah. it's sad. I mean, it's really sad. Well, that's um, why we have subculture and there's always been subcultural movements that had nothing to do with the art world. And then there's always been this, you know, uh, cross pollination and um you know we got to just keep keep that going it feels like subculture has gotten kind of strange for for us that are a little older <laughs> it feels like uh you know there used to be specific movements that you could tell were happening right and it's become um so rapid now so quick and in, uh, infiltrated by media and technology but nevertheless there are still movements I know with all my younger friends, I have a lot of artists, uh, friends that are younger. None of them have gone to art school. It, they, it's almost like fine art to them doesn't really make sense. They incorporate it in all these different ways. And that was something I noticed with you, Edgar. It's like you, you, you're blending it in the world. It's much more expansive. It's not just focused on this one elitist canon, you know? 
Yeah, most of my art practice has been in like the underground and the DIY in the, you know, in different scenes that were outside of the art realm, but also I would say, you know, definitely inspired and in conversation with the art realm. Um, and I and and I really think that, you know, I really feel like I'm a part of a huge web of people who are blending art and magic and witchcraft and healing and therapy. And so that really just makes me feel um, so much more empowered and to be able to, you um, yeah, kind of meet those conversations on, um, and I guess I'm even thinking about this because I have like a review coming up in a couple of weeks at school and like just, you know, thinking about this conversation and bringing that into that space of, yeah, kind of being able, because I'm, I'm, the project I'm working on actually is about like, um, I did a workshop where people communed with a plant and they created an art piece inspired by that work, uh, by that ceremony that we had together. And so I'm definitely bringing like animism to like the front and center of my practice because it's been a big part of my practice and and also social engagement and kind of working virtually because of the pandemic as well. I really love that you're working academically and then you're working in the underground and you're working, you know, with indigenous ideas and spirituality and then putting them on social media. And it's just a really wonderful cross platforming. And so, you know, you know, and you said something in your talk that was very inspiring uh, that you did with Brainerd Terry for Yale. Let me just find your page and you said you have hope you said um we are in the midst of a great revolution optimistic belief in the world cosmos and you 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 are optimistic and have a belief in the world cosmos and somehow we will struggle through this death and res resurrection i think I, I was talking actually about the work of an astrologer and historian who teaches at the what is it the university for integral studies or whatever in san francisco he's a, a genius named richard tarnas t-a-r-n-a-s and he wrote a book called cosmos and psyche he has like two doctorates from harvard you're like one in history and one in whatever and he's written about uh, the, this period we're in right now as you know we're going into the age of aquarius on the 21st of december but we've been in this huge Pluto Saturn transit. It's the biggest transit since the uh, French Revolution, and we're passing into something else now. And you can you can really feel it. You can yeah. feel this 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 powerful shift. I mean, I can feel it. I mean, it, it's strange. I can I can really feel it. Uh, I I've felt it for a couple of years, uh, just because you know because of the amount of publishing I've done. Uh, on all of these topics. I mean, this would not have been possible even 10 years earlier. There, so there, that shows there's a huge interest in this. Uh, I think that something is shifting and uh, I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I'm fairly optimistic. I think we're going to have huge challenges, but I think something is shifting. It's, it's interesting. Uh, I, I, it's funny, Darren was talking about his ancestors. I'm working on my Guggenheim project right now. And it's about, it's a fairy tale about the miners in Colorado, the Irish miners. And uh, it's, it's fascinating because I, I just was on a, a video last night with a historian showing me, I mean, it's just gut-wrenching. The Free Catholic Cemetery in Leadville, Colorado with the thousands and thousands and thousands. I mean, you see this huge field with trees and with hundreds of indentations from where the people were buried, the graves have sunken, where you see where thousands and thousands of Irish people working for starvation wages died. And the average age of a person in the free Catholic cemetery of thousands of people is 23 years of age. That includes, of course, a lot of infant mortality. Uh, but I mean, it's, you know, it's funny how you talk about the ancestors. You know, you really, I think in the West, you feel that you feel where I grew up, you know, you feel the, the, the Native American ancestors, but also uh, the ancestors of the famine stock. I mean, it was not so easy for anybody. Yeah, they were very low on the totem pole for quite some time. The they were the lowest. They were the lowest, except for the Chinese. And the Chinese also, like they, they shipped, after the Chinese built the railroads and worked the mines, they shipped them all back home to China. I mean, they put thousands and thousands of them on the boats. I mean, there's a story in the Colorado mines that, a, that one of the owners of the mine didn't want to pay the China, Chinese workers. 
So there were a bunch of them in a shaft and he dynamited the shaft shut. That's common up in um, the area where I'm in the mining. They would just kill them before they'd pay them. So somebody said, um, this is Joanna Posig, who's a wonderful painter who lives in Oakland or in the East Bay. She said, the visual and public art department where I taught is a great under, has, uh, is a great undergrad program at CSUMB. I'm not sure which school that is. Consistently working outside of the canon. Woohoo, that's good. Got to shake it up. Um, all right, well, I think it's time for Linda's, Linda's closing wonderful song. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> if my dog was smaller, I would, I would pick him up, but he's over in the corner. Um, how about you, Darren? Why don't you pick a number between 1 and 24? Oh, oh 1 and 24. OK. Um, or like a 12. 12, Linda. Are you there? <laughs> we might have lost her. Oh, here she is. Oh. She is. This is a lullaby for all of the children. Who are artists, healers. And they all are. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little white as snow. Everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went, that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. It followed her to school one day, school one day. School one day, it followed her to school one day that was against the world. It made the children laugh and play. Laugh and play, laugh and play. It made the children laugh and play to see a laugh at
<laughs> Thank you so much. Thank yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Monica. Thank you, everybody. You were all fabulous. Yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Ah, oh, stay in touch, you all. It's been a really wonderful experience. Uh, kept me very busy, but. God, <laughs> you've done such a great job. I mean, as a curator, you've had so much patience. I mean, my God, going through my 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 photographs, I thought this woman's a saint. She says. <laughs> Just a beautiful, hey, beautiful. I want people to see you, Monet. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for for bringing. You don't know what this has meant just to have this time with with fellow medicine medicine workers. Just all of us. It's just been so beautiful and so out of the depths into the beauty. Thank you so much. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Blessings to everybody, and thank you all. It was so great to connect with all of you. <laughs> Linda. <laughs> Stay safe, all. Yeah, thank you, everyone. Somebody had raised their hand, and I just don't want to miss something, but I don't even know how to get to it. If you want to, if you want to put something in chat, you can. Okay, it was a mistake. Okay, all right. Love to you all. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Invocation of Democracy can be seen at Pro Arts Commons by typing in Pro Arts with an S, Commons with an S, dot org, slash, forward slash, Invocation Democracy. There are three galleries. Uh, they're 3D. They're really fun to navigate and move through. There's many video works and all different kinds of works. And um, I hope you'll go see the show and, and enjoy it and take it in and let it let it give to you there's a lot lot there to take in and be given okay we'll put it on the chat okay you guys thank you thank you so much for spending this afternoon together with me and yeah and with our audience and um, we'll make a recording so we'll be able to watch it again and stay in touch everybody yeah okay okay bye bye <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Linda. You look like the saint that you are. Oh, my God. Look how beautiful. Oh, we're all saints. We're all saints. We're all saints. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, Monet. Beautiful.